begin. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Mel Earnshaw from the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Unit. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you very much for joining us this morning as we kickstart our International Women's Day activities. Uh, just a few housekeeping reminders for everyone. Um, as I mentioned in the chat, uh, we will be recording this session. So if you would like to uh, turn off your, your video, um, that would be, a, that'll be fine. And also please put your microphone on mute if you are not speaking. Um, also a gentle reminder about the uh, respectful engagement agreement that we have circulated to all attendees. Um, also, just to give um, a brief background really about the International Women's Day or IWD, IWD is a day where uh, women are recognized for their outstanding achievements despite divisions and persisting boundaries. It has helped strengthen support for women's rights movements and participation in politics and the economy in various settings, including the higher education sector. International Women's Day is commemorated globally, and today we are privileged to be holding this panel discussion where we can unpack what it means to break the bias through the stories of our female chaplains here at Durham. I am pleased to introduce our panel chair this morning, the Reverend Dr. Stephanie Burrett. Stephanie is our chaplain for University College and is Solway Fellow. She is a graduate of Yale Divinity School and Berkeley Episcopal Seminary at Yale, where she studied theology and prepared for ordination to the priesthood. Originally from France, she earned a PhD at the Sorbonne on French literature with a strong emphasis on art history. Prior to joining Durham, she served in Florence, Italy, and in Jerusalem, where she particularly enjoyed engaging with people from all over the world and of different beliefs and religions. Stephanie has been engaged in a wide range of activities in the university college community. As chaplain and Salve Fellow, she not only has ministerial and pastoral responsibilities as chaplain, but is also an academic and member um, of the Department of Theology and Religion. So without further ado, I will now hand you over to Stephanie. Thank you very much, Mel. Um, thank you very much for this introduction and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks also to uh, Chauvin for all the work you both have done behind the scene um, to organize this, this event. Before I introduce our three fantastic panelists, I'm going to say just a few words about what is a chaplain and what we do as chaplains. So the four of us, uh, and we are very sorry that Anna is encountering some difficulties with her camera, but we are hopeful that this will be sorted out by the time she can speak. Um, so the four of us are obviously university chaplains. Uh, you can have hospital chaplains, army chaplains, pr prison chaplains, etc. And here at Durham University, we are an integral part of the welfare provision and pastoral support that Durham University offers to its students and to its staff. We have a lead chaplain in the person of Gavin Ward, and we are a robust group of chaplains of different religions and faiths, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and a non-religious chaplain with our humanist chaplain. Some of us are volunteers, some of us are full-time or part-time employed by a college or the university. Some of us are based here in Durham. Some of us share their time in different cities or campuses. So we meet with students and staff for pastoral and or spiritual matters. We organize and lead services or prayer times depending on our own traditions. We organize events within our communities or across the university events that can help educate about faith or religion, including interfaith dialogue. We advise how to best serve the various religious communities represented by students and staff here in Durham. So our role is truly multifaceted and we weave the one-on-one -on -one conversation within the broader picture of our whole diverse community here in Durham. How to make space for your faith within your work or your studies can be challenging especially perhaps in what seems to be an increasingly secularized society, although this is not true across the world. And as chaplains, we can help articulate this. So I'm going to start by introducing our three panelists. After that, I will ask them to share a bit about their stories. And then we'll have a few questions for about 15 minutes. And then we'll open the questions to you all, to the audience, 
Uh, and please, in that, uh, that moment, feel free to either type your questions in the chat, to raise your hand, either your physical hand or um, the, um, the icon in the, um, at the bottom of your, of your screen reactions. And Mel and I will do our very best to keep an eye on everything. So, biographies. Um, Reverend Canon Anna Booker. So, Anna has been the chaplain of St. John's College since 2019 and is also the priest in charge of St. Brendan's Church in Bransford. Before her current post, she worked for the Church of England in both urban and suburban parts of West London and in former mining villages in East Durham. She was the Dean for Women's Ministry in London at a time when women priests were very few in number and has long been involved in theological education and training. Anna's main passions as a priest are enabling others to fulfill their potential and encouraging Christians to be actively involved in their local communities. Lizzie, so Dhamma Master Lizzie Coombs is the university's Buddhist chaplain. She has been practicing with the Kwan Home School of Zen since 1989 and did most of her Zen training at the Providence Zen Center in Rhode Island in the USA. Alongside her role at Durham, she's also a guiding teacher for the York Zen Group and the Peak Zen Center in Matlock Bath in Derbyshire. Lizzie grew up mostly in the UK, but lived in the US for 35 years. Whilst in the US, she worked professionally as a conservator of art on paper, retiring when she returned to the UK in 2010. Mashid, Dr. Mashid Tana is a freelance researcher and lecturer in Muslim theology and co-director for International Foundation for Muslim Theology. She is the Muslim chaplain for Durham University and the first female Muslim chaplain to be appointed in the university in the United Kingdom. Currently, she is also co-chair for Durham University BAME Network. In the community, she is Muslim representative and advisor for SACRA, a standing advisory council on religious education. She's a trustee for Canter Durham Faiths Network and advisor for Durham Police Commission and various other community groups. So first question for, for you all, which is not exactly a question, but more tell us about your story. How did you end up being a chaplain? So you want me to go first, yeah? Um, yeah, I'm Mashi, thank you for the introduction. And I have lived in this beautiful city for over 40 years. And most of that time, a lot of that time, I've been involved with Durham University Islamic Society in some capacity. For example, while I was a student, I was a female vice president of Islamic Society and also held various other positions. Um, I felt that one thing that was lacking though was a private space for confidential help and support to both students and staff. So there was a real need for someone experienced in this field to give support and listen to the needs of Muslim students and staff. And having been trained as a mental health social worker, as, uh, as well as studied in the field of Muslim theology, I felt that it would be really good to inquire about becoming a Muslim chaplain. I then went on to actually do a master's in counseling, pastoral care and Muslim cha chaplaincy specifically, so I could support, uh, be more in, in line with chaplaincy work. Um, and it must be around 13 years ago when I first inquired about, about becoming a Muslim cha chaplain. And it took a long time for arrangements to be made because I was the first person as a non-contractual chaplain for Durham University. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, and also the first female Muslim chaplain to be appointed as a chaplain in a higher education setting. So that's me really, it's, uh, it's really the, my own experience of um, 
the prayer room, we did have a prayer room. Uh, the first prayer room was not where all the Albert, and it didn't belong to the university. It, it, the community had bought a house and converted it into a Moscow prayer room, and it was at Kipia Heights, even further away. It was in Durham City, but even further away from uh, from the science site and where you know where their students were mainly, and the colleges. So, um, so that was a long, long time ago, and it, and it has its history. But um, what's always been missing, I think, because it's uh, prayer rooms, uh, it's like a public place, really. People come and you don't really have that private space. So it, I felt that there was really a need to support different students uh, with different with their problems and um, having that space and, and knowing someone to be able to come to with that, with, with any problems or issues was, was something that was lacking. Um, I mean, we had imams that come to the, but imam is basically uh, a prayer leader. It's not, they're not really qualified. They may not be qualified if they haven't gone through other training to be able to, in a non-judgmental way, uh, support all staff with uh, faith problems or other spiritual problems. So I felt that uh, I really needed to do this and uh, I've not looked back really. Thank you, Mashad. Lizzie? Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for organizing this day. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I was recruited to be the first Buddhist chaplain um, at this university when um, someone who had been attending the Zen group that I run in York, who's a faculty member at um, Durham, said, they're looking for someone, are you interested? And I said, okay, but I don't know what would be involved. And um, so I'll come to an initial meeting and see what happens. And I was warmly welcomed by uh, Gavin, the uh, managing chaplain, and um, looked around campus and thought that would be great. But um, what with uh, having to get background checks and also COVID hitting at just about the same time, everything suddenly went quiet. <clears throat> and so I, f I feel personally that living in York as I do, um, I haven't had as much engagement with the university, much less the students, as I anticipated doing. Um, but I do hope that this will, will change. I, I first became interested in chaplaincy um, after I moved back to the United Kingdom, when I went to my local hospital to see if <clears throat> there was any need for someone who could um, be with patients that were interested in seeing if meditation could help them in any way, um, helping with symptoms or just um, family problems or anxiety or anything. And um, I was pretty much shown the door by the um, chaplains who were already in place, um, <clears throat> not in an unkind way, but just that they didn't understand what I was asking and why, you know, and who are you and what are your qualifications and why do you think, um, that's something that we'd really want. Um, that changed actually. So I, I left and I just went back to my Zen teaching <clears throat> um, and my meditation groups. And then, and then everything changed because I believe that there was a, a mandate. I don't know if it was a national government mandate, perhaps it was, that um, there had to be provision for uh, non-Christian beliefs and faiths um, in the various chaplaincy sectors. And I've since heard that all kinds of chaplains, of different faiths are attending that hospital now. So that, that sparked my interest. And I, I think what's really great and what, what Mashid was talking about was this idea that, that you can engage with people, uh, not necessarily of your own faith, um, but who just have questions or they just want to talk one on one about something that's bothering them or they have questions about in their spiritual 
life, i.e. their non-material life. Um, the other day I was talking to a group of students from another university and they didn't know much about Buddhism, but each of them had a particular issue. Uh, one couldn't sleep, one had extreme anger problems, one was um, actually was in tears, even though she spoke, she was very distressed about the situation in Ukraine. Someone else had chronic health problems. And, you know, that's just the reality of human, human life, you know. And so how can any religion address those concerns? So I imagine that um, as and when I can come to grips, so to speak, with um, being a chaplain in Durham, uh, at the university, I'll encounter similar things and it'll be really great to, to talk to people and listen. Listening is the most important part of a chaplain's job and being alongside people as they find their own solutions to different issues. So I think that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Anna, we still can't see you, but we can hear you. Well, it's lovely to be with you, and I can see some of you. Uh, our maintenance uh, person from college is on their way to help me. Uh, for me, the, the word story is really important in your question, Stephanie, because um, how I ended up here as chaplain is part of the bigger story for me of both education and faith. I grew up in, in Liverpool and uh, neither of my parents had been able to uh, have education beyond their mid-teens. And so they uh, prized education very highly, uh, prioritized it. Uh, I was also fortunate, I think, in that I'm the youngest of three children in my family. There were high expectations on my older sister as the firstborn. There were very high expectations on my brother as the only boy. And uh, then I kind of jollied along behind. And I think that made a real difference, but I was particularly aware that when it came to education, uh, they um, sent my brother to a private school that they paid for because they believed that was the very best. Uh, I was fortunate to go to a local school not to be sent away from home and uh, I then uh, was in a much more uh, mixed setting. Uh, I was fortunate it was mixed in the sense of social backgrounds of people who lived across different areas of Liverpool uh, and I had a really inspirational head teacher who believed that the girls in her care, for it was an all girls school, which was much more, pop, much more common in those days anyway. She believed that we could do anything, even though there were many university courses that were not really open to women. Uh, I took a pretty conventional route. Uh, I went to university in York, Lizzie, I agree, it's a beautiful place to live. Uh, and I studied English there, and then I went into primary education, which again is a very traditional thing for uh, women to do. I loved primary teaching, and I was very aware that within that profession, I have many female role models in senior roles. So I would say part of my story is the women in leadership who've inspired me. Um, but I was conscious too that it was not the same for many friends from university uh, who didn't go on to teach yet, uh, next. When I um, left teaching to join the Church of England, by that time I had um, a family as well. So I'd done a fair amount of uh, juggling of parenting, which again, much easier as a teacher than in many professions. Um, when I left to join the Church of England, I was very much in a minority, uh, but the church by then had decided to um, ordain women as priests. And uh, that meant that I was heading for the same role as my male peers in college. Um, I did encounter at that point 
the kind of reality that I was going to be in a minority. And because I was in London, uh, London is, was and remains predominantly uh, male in terms of its clergy, although things have changed a lot. Um, I was told when I set out to uh, train in the Church of England uh, that I could go off and do my training, uh, but there probably wouldn't be a paid job for me at the end of it. Um, fortunately, that proved not to be true. Uh, I was then told that I could do my next post, my curacy, which is a period of three to four years um, alongside somebody else continuing to learn and train, uh, but that there wouldn't be a job post of responsibility for me running a parish. Thankfully, that also proved untrue, but it was that as if I was um, taking steps on a path that was yet to be uncovered. Uh, and so I was able to uh, lead a parish in London uh, and do a number of other things connected uh, with that. But at a time when there were, I think, 120 uh, clergy in the area of London where I was leading churches, and six of us were women. So we were in a severe uh, minority. As Stephanie uh, mentioned, I was asked to be the Dean for Women's Ministry in that area, which was a hugely, hugely rewarding time. Uh, learning a lot from my colleagues, many of whom were unpaid, giving their services voluntarily, many of whom had worked for years and years and years uh, within the church without their leadership and gifts uh, being, I would say, fully um, recognised in the way they might have been. Uh, I frequently found myself the only woman in the room, and that was very good for my uh, self-control, self-discipline in uh, not responding uh, to some of the comments and assumptions uh, that were made, uh, but actually uh, just calmly joining in discussions and seeking to bring fresh perspectives uh, into the room. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, but chaplaincy, I think, uh, has always been a part of the story for me uh, in the, that drawing alongside and listening. Uh, Lizzie said the most important thing in chaplaincy is listening. I agree wholeheartedly. That was something I was able to do uh, in one post in West London, in Brentford, where we ran a community cafe. Um, we uh, set up a little team called Open Ears of people who would just sit with people who were on their own, uh, taking several lonely hours over a cuppa, uh, just sit with them and offer friendship. Uh, and then as the relationship developed, sometimes offered to pray with people if they wanted us to as well. That was something I did as a school governor in a number of different contexts where um, my role as the local vicar, the local um, Church of England clergy person uh, meant that I could listen and people uh, knew that what they said to me would be confidential. Um, and quite often I would talk with uh, teachers, head teachers, other governors in that way, as somebody kind of around the edge of things uh, who could offer a safe space. And so to St John's in Durham, um, St John's has a Christian foundation as a college, but welcomes students of all faiths. Uh, it does mean, however, that the role of chaplain has been here for a very long time and there was a, um, a great female priest before me, so I didn't, have, didn't find it a struggle to fit in here. Um, I would just say it's an incredible privilege uh, to be within a college here um, because uh, as you will have realised, I feel so passionately about educational opportunities for women. Um, that's one of the things that I especially uh, hope to enable women to fulfil uh, their potential educationally and that flourishing, uh, which is often at the heart of education and also spirituality. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. You, um, you actually mentioned so some of the challenges that you experienced as, as a female clergy, finding yourselves often the only woman in the room and how you managed to overcome this or to deal with this, approach it. And um, Mashid, uh, Lizzie, could you tell us more about your own experiences? Have you encountered challenges as, as female chaplains and how did you deal with them? Um, yeah, I suppose I have uh, met some challenges and the biggest one has been about, I think somebody's already mentioned it, is making assumptions. And what does assumptions involve? Assumptions involves judgment. It's, it's about guesswork. It's about passing opinions not grounded in facts. It, it is there for it can then result in prejudice even though it might not be intended so um, assumptions I think can affect everyone in a very negative way and I can give you some examples because I don't always wear a hair covering for example um, there have been people guessworking and coming straight to me and saying oh you must be Baha'i you know and um, and on the other hand um, Another person, other people may say, oh, I'm so pleased that you don't wear a hair covering, you know, so, you know, you get it from all sides, these kinds of comments. And then they ask you where, where you come from, where were you born? And you might, and I say I was born in Iran and there's this big assumption, oh, you must be Shia. Or you must be Sufi, you know, not are you, but you must be. This, this kind of judgments. Not that there's anything wrong with being those things, but you know, um, it, it's not, it's just seeing from their own perspective and making that judgment. Um, but it doesn't come from people who are not necessarily educated or don't understand. It could be coming from academics as well. Um, uh, some academics who are, who hyper specialize, for example, devote their whole life in understanding the life of maggots, for example. Um, this is excellent and um, we need them and it's admirable. But when they are out of their field, they may some may make some assumptions uh, as they may not have only a fragmented view of things in other areas. So it's really about everyone. It can come from, this kind of assumptions can come from everyone. And it's really, really important for all of us, academics, uh, non-academics, uh, different faiths, and to just to broaden our horizons. And that is, that is the difficulty with me, you know, with, any, with, with all of us, the, how, how are we broadening our horizon? I've also had much experience of somehow being seen as inferior to men. Even some well-intentioned compliments felt like insults. For example, um, I've heard this said to me quite a few times, behind every great man, there is a great woman. Maybe I don't understand this saying, but it's this mindset that women's job is always to be behind men to be there to support them to be great. Nothing about um, them trying to be great too. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, maybe I misunderstand, but I'm sure this is well intended. And maybe I have a complex as well because I've been asked so many times, why do Muslim women walk behind their men? And I've always replied either, well, I don't, or, maybe they have longer legs and just walk faster you know so it is an assumption that all muslim women do that there's an assumption that this is not a cultural thing this must be have to do with the faith so lots and lots of assumptions and it's always this idea that a woman can't do the job as well as a man and there's of course also there's a fact that there's a lack of ignorance as well about what it means to be a muslim chaplain and although the word, the word chaplain is a Christian term, but shepherding, helping people to come back to the right path is very much part of the Muslim faith. 
I mean, I get so many times say, why are you a Muslim chaplain? This is Christian, but not at all. All the prophets, all our prophets, which Muslims believe, Jesus, Moses, Abraham, they were all engaged in pastoral care, which pastoral care basically means doing theology or integrating belief in our everyday life. And practical theology is transformative. And that's what we're there for, to help people see things from a different or broader perspective. So, and we have to, I have to say this as well, there's no clergy in Islam, so you can't be a clergy anyway. And often people talk about Imam. Imam is basically means a prayer leader and anyone who is well versed in Quran can lead prayers. But Islamic scholars, however, th these are the people who have knowledge and experience in Muslim theology, and they are an informal body of scholars. So they are usually separate from the state, and like Christianity, unlike Christianity, I should say, they don't administer sacraments. So chaplains who are trained in Muslim th theology are there to help people to find their way in a non-judgmental way. So it's absolutely okay to say Muslim chaplain, although actual word is, is a Christian word, because the chaplaincy is what they do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michelle, like for the clarification as well for everything you shared, which is uh, really deeply meaningful. And I think it resonates with quite a few of us as well. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, I know that Anna raised her hand, but I just wanted to make sure that Lizzie, if you, did you have anything to, to add or share about this? Yeah, certainly. Um, uh, all of my training <clears throat> is in um, Zen Buddhism. And also, um, almost all of it was done in the United States. <clears throat> um, so I, I shouldn't say so, but it's true that I have experienced relatively little uh, gender bias um, in my spiritual development. Um, the head of my Zen school, which is international, um, is a woman, and she is my personal teacher. And from the very beginning, uh, I, I was first invited, you know, did I want to come and learn how to meditate from a, a female friend um, in her home? I, I, I showed up, I meditated, I went, oh my God, I didn't know I didn't know that this was possible, you know, and, and that was it. Um, I, I, I've been scratching my head really metaphorically trying to think of situations where the fact that I was female held me back in some way in my spiritual development or in my um, development as a Zen teacher. I really have looked into this and I really cannot come up with anything that spoke to me as, oh, well, because you're a woman, you do not get to do this, or you do not fully understand, you're, or you cannot be fully realized in, in this tradition. Um, I'm not sure why, maybe I just was very fortunate, but it might be also that the very foundation of the Zen form of Buddhism, which is what I'm most familiar with, is all about investigating what is a human being? What am I? And so it may be that we're particularly alert, and I'm not trying to make this a virtue or, you know, a, or, or trying to proselytize or anything, but it might be that the very fact that the foundation of um, what we're invited to do is to look deeply, as deeply as we can into what it means to be human somehow doesn't allow people to, people who are invested in this to um, use that sort of lazy thinking, you know, because the, the whole idea is that anything that you can say with language is a label, you know, it's provisional, it's not the actual thing. Uh, I don't want to go any further into any kind of theology and cause any offense, but um, that's that's the direction I'm coming from. Therefore, if you label <clears throat> uh, male, female, bisexual, anything you want to say, dog, cat, in some ways, 
um, that's an idea of what the thing is. It's, it's, it can be a very useful idea, but as, as we've already just been unpacking, it can also be a great hindrance. So we have to be very, very careful. And, and I think that vigilance without paranoia is, is a very important part of what we're all doing. Um, I just want to say one other thing, which is that um, when, I, <clears throat> when I was practicing and working in the United States, I was privileged to be part of a large multi-faith group of um, religious um, leaders, local religious leaders, and we'd meet once a month and we'd, there'd be a question and everybody got three minutes to talk to that question in their own tradition, from their own understanding. No one else could say anything. And boy, we learned so much, all of us as a group, and we became so connected. And again, it was male, female. It was, there was no, you know, there, were, there wasn't anything about anyone had privilege. Um, if I, in the course of this event, <laughs> come up with, oh, wait a minute, no, that was definitely a gender, gender problem, I'll certainly raise my hand. Thank you, Lizzie. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's very, like, each story matters, each voice matters. So it's very good to have your own, uh, your own experience of um, if there was any, like, gender discrimination, but maybe that has something to do with how things are approached. Um, Anna, did you want to add something? Thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to add really from the Church of England perspective as uh, someone who works for the established church in this country with all the kind of traditions and cultural bias that that uh, involves. Um, we've, we've been on a journey over the last years uh, many, many, many people are influenced most by the portrayals of clergy that they see on television. I've lost count of the number of times people have um, referred to the Vicar of Dibley. And, um, you know, uh, either humorously, but also with a hint of assuming that um, I will be just like her. And of course, just like all men aren't the same, all women aren't the same either. Uh, the other thing I've encountered is that uh, people expect me to know every other female priest in the Church of England. Uh, if I'm the first female priest they've met, they say, oh, you must know my friend so-and-so, um, who's in uh, Penzance. And I think, um, no, actually, I don't. Strange. Um, we ha I'm uh, married to Nick, and uh, almost everybody who comes to the door of our home, which is named the Rectory, assumes that he is the priest. Um, that's just a general assumption. He delights in saying, well, actually, no, the vicar's not in at the moment. And they kind of look at him um, in utter surprise. Uh, I have ended up to my great surprise um, in five, no, six different churches in the Church of England being the first woman licensed as the incumbent, which means the person who's leading the church. Um, so we're still on that same journey. And um, I think it's just going to take a long time. I would like to think uh, that the Church of England uh, with the head of state, the Queen, um, is actually making a difference to the way that women are viewed in leadership. Uh, having said earlier that when I worked in London, women were very few and far between. Many of you will know that uh, the Bishop of London, Sarah Mullally, with her professional background uh, in healthcare, played an incredibly significant role during the pandemic. Um, and I think that's brilliant. So I really hope that things are uh, changing now and that what uh, we can be doing not only in the Church of England but across all faith groups is uh, demonstrating uh, the need to work in partnership, men and women together. Um, uh, that that is the best way, really. Thank you. Thank you very very much, Anna. Um, 
I could ask you a question. However, I see that it's almost a quarter past 11 and I'm wondering if there would be questions from the audience. I'm happy to ask questions, but um, I'm curious to see if after hearing your stories, after hearing um, the, the challenges you have noticed and Mashin, you were also talking about you know, intersectionality and assumptions about Islam and, and, um, and about which are entirely entwined with you know race and um i'm wondering if if the audience would have any any questions on that maybe from their perspective their experience of chaplaincy or how they have imagined chaplains to be i'm not seeing any hand being raised or any questions in the chat so i'm going to ask a question so um do you think through of you, do you think that uh, chaplaincy is a male-dominated um, ministry? Um, and a follow-up question on this is, what's your hope? Um, from my perspective, I think it still is to an extent. It's not as bad as it used to be. Um, I, from the, certainly from the Muslim perspective, it is. Um, the fact that I was the first female chaplain in the higher education was, you know, in itself says a lot. Um, but increasingly, universities are now employing female chaplains generally, more female chaplains. When I was a ch chaplain here, there weren't that many Christian female chaplains either. I remember there was only one. So, you know, it, but we, we have grown. And also a Muslim chaplain, uh, I met five more female Muslim chaplains since then. And they're all paid Muslim chaplains in higher education settings um, in Cambridge, in Portsmouth, Manchester, Loughborough, Leeds. They, these are all female Muslim chaplains working in the university context in higher education. So things are changing, yeah. So yeah, I think people are getting to know, getting gradually used to the idea of um, the, you know, Muslim chaplaincy. Yeah. Um, I'm part of a couple of other chaplaincy networks and <clears throat> um, we're noticing more um, females coming in to get training in healthcare uh, trusts and in prisons, um, which is very hopeful and helpful. And so I, I don't see why, I think it so much, it's like with sciences, you know, the more females you have in any profession, the more visible they are, therefore, the more it appears that any, any other person of that gender could do that that work and um, it's certainly they're discovering that um, it, by having more female scientists, the questions that are getting asked are revealing huge areas in the life sciences um, that were completely unknown, that they're learning things that are quite overturning some of the, some of the Darwinian um, assumptions, if you will. So why not in this very important human endeavor of um, spirituality? Has to be. Thank you, Lizzie. Anna, did you want to add anything on this? I think I um, would agree largely that chaplaincy is changing. And my experience in Durham is that uh, one of the joys of this role is working across a team which is mixed, a diverse team. Um, and I, I think, uh, yeah, it's great to see how the uh, the gender balance has has uh, grown as well as the diversity of faiths uh, included in the uh, network. Thank you, Anna. Uh, we have received a question in in the chat. I'm going to read it uh, to you, and um, any want anybody who wants to um, so much, Lizzie, Anna uh, wants to answer it, please do. So the theme of this year's um, so of, um, International Women's Day is breaking the bias. Do you have a clear recollection of an event or incident when you had felt that you had broken down bias in your respective roles? Thank you, uh, Rachel, for, for the question. If you wanted to add anything and speak for yourself, please do just write your question. 
from my perspective, I think it's the general, it's very general because we are always trying to break down biases as a chaplain um, in every possible way. Um, so I think the media has portrays things in the interest of certain people or just to sell and so on. So we know that media has a lot of influence on people. Um, I, so I actually get invited to go and help schools, for example, or people to break down biases. Um, um, schools, for example, may withdraw um, children from studying Islam because of the negative uh, media um, news that they have received. And so, and there may be kind of incidents of racism experienced by children. So I'm kind of invited in there to tell it how it is rather than them receiving the in information from the wrong sources to dispel myths basically. So this is so much part of my job. And also it affects us, how, who we are as chaplains, the reflect, self-reflection is really important. What's happening now? What am I hearing all the time? Is what I'm hearing is what they want me to hear or do I need to broaden that perspective to take that into account, but also see a broader, broader uh, perspective and that puts me then in a position not to be limited in my judgment when I help to go up help others to dispel myths so i think that self-reflection is constantly needed to to do that um, um there was something else i wanted to say but i'll, I'll come back to it so, thank you thank you Rachel. lizzie you had your hand raised um well i just recently did encounter an instance where um uh, in my other chaplain work in the prison um, someone approached me and I'm going to be careful because I, you know, it's confidentiality and all that, but um, <clears throat> there was some kind of assumption going on and because I was new in that place, the person making the assumption thought they could speak to me in a particular way and it was someone who had authority and um, and I could see the look of surprise on their face when I didn't go along with the assumption that they were making. It was just quite interesting. It was like a very quick thing. And after that, uh, they told me their name and suddenly we were sort of peers trying to figure out a solution to a problem involving a third party. Um, I don't know it didn't have anything to do with Buddhist or anything, but I think that that whole business of being really careful and really, really listening and being really, really aware. And as Rashid said, constant self-reflection, like what am I bringing to this? What, how am I about to react? Is it helpful? And if you really give yourself to a situation, another person, uh, that, that openness with one's own spiritual strength as the sort of inner armor, if you will. Uh, it really does, it breaks down barriers without one having to be very effortful about it, I, I find. The effort comes in the spiritual training and the spiritual development of oneself and how you bring your professional um, abilities to each situation you encounter. Thank you, Lucy. Anna, did you want to give your... Thank you. Um, very interesting, um, Lucy, what you say, and it resonates for me with an experience very early on, long before I was a chaplain, but when I was first ordained in the Church of England, or about to be completing my training, and I went to see my bishop, who was the person who held the, the power to offer me uh, a post in the church or not. Uh, there were assumptions on his side that because I was married to someone earning a salary, um, I might be prepared to offer my services for free. Um, I had left teaching um, 
uh, a professional career in order to train residentially for two years. And it was very important to me uh, that I didn't then become a volunteer, but I pursued uh, what I felt was uh, my calling. And uh, during the course of that um, conversation, I became aware, as Lizzie says, of a, an inner strength, a, a spiritual sense of uh, knowing what uh, I would say God was asking me to do. And so when he said, if I can't offer you a paid post, what will you do? I said, well, I will look elsewhere for one, uh, which was not the expected answer. The expected answer was, oh, well, I could probably work without a stipend, without uh, pay in the church. Uh, and after that moment, the conversation changed and we worked things through. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, he was listening very well and he continued to listen and that's the person who appointed me as a uh, as a vicar leading a church along with three other women he appointed four of us very close together uh, which was great for the first time uh, he did that just three years later uh, and also had the humility to invite all of us women uh, who were under his authority and care. I remember he invited us for a meal at his house where he served us the meal and he told us um, the journey he had been on in relation to his views of uh, women in the Church of England. Uh, so thank you, Lizzie, you've reminded me of all of that. Thank you, Anna. Um, Mashid, did you remember what you wanted to add or? No, you okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, any other question from the from the audience? Thank you very much, Rachel, for for your question. No. All right. Um, so, what 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 what's your hope? I mean, you, you have seen things changing. You've seen um, progress in that sense. Um, what's your hope, or what would be your advice to somebody who is um, uh, thinking about doing chaplaincy work. Uh, and that may be a man, a woman, a non-binary person. What would you, what would you, what would be your advice? I think it's, it's tough being a Muslim chaplain, especially. Um, uh, I would advise that People should try and get some background knowledge in counselling, for example, not that we are counsellors at all, but in order to apply those listening skills, uh, in order to uh, stress the importance of being non-judgmental, have a non-judgmental approach and so on, just skill wise, but Muslim uh, chaplains are not counsellors, they have a unique position. Uh, also to get some experience, maybe to shadow a chaplain to see if this is exactly exactly this, this is something that they do want to do also it would really be good to actually have that knowledge so i would definitely recommend enrolling for a master's course in muslim chaplaincy at markfield so that's to really understand what the role entails and uh, have the skills to do it and more importantly to study for this field to study muslim theology and that doesn't mean just islamic law because that can easily be found out. You know, you just go, go on to online, you can, it's all there, get a book and it's all there. But theological questions about life, death, creation, and so on, so that you're able to give spiritual support as well as practical support. Lizzie? Yeah, well, yes, everything that you've just said, Mashid, but, um, not to be not to be um, afraid of of just trying something new, and it may be that it might take a while to get the necessary training, but it's enormously enriching. <clears throat> just just doing training for chaplaincy is so opens you up to so many things, and um, and you can't necessarily know what form of chaplaincy you're going to be uh, you're going to find yourself in. When you, when you start out, 
I just discovered that there's uh, chaplains to the fire service. And I know someone who's about to go in that direction. Um, but the whole point is that you're learning how to be with people where they are and, and, and use all your resources, uh, spiritual and otherwise, um, to really engage with the suffering and the questions of others without letting yourself, letting too much of your own color, color that um, interaction. So you can only you can only grow. It will be enormously challenging. It can be lot. It will be lots of fun, and um, really, really rewarding. So I just say everybody should just go for it. And barriers are there to be looked into and um, surmounted, and it makes you stronger. Thank you, Lucy. Anna, any advice from you? Um, every every opportunity or every situation we encounter is something from which we learn and grow. And uh, particularly for any of you who will soon be graduating and looking for jobs, I would say just take with both hands whatever is available uh, because we learn so much from other people and uh, there's something about the weaving image that Stephanie used at the beginning that chaplains weave those one-to-one -one conversations into a wider context and I think our lives are uh, woven together in that no experience is ever wasted and the number of times uh, quite a way into my life now I see things that I did many years ago suddenly becoming relevant and coming into focus again. We never stop learning, we never stop growing. And chaplaincy is, if we have the gift of being able to serve as chaplains, is a time when we can use such a range of experiences and skills that we may have uh, gathered through the years. Thanks very much, Anna. Uh, thanks to the three of you, really. Um, I am conscious of the time we started late, but uh, I'm also conscious that uh, some of us may have other meetings after this or other events related to International Women's Day. So um, I'll conclude. But so thank you very, very much indeed to our three panelists. Thanks again very much to Shoban and Mel for all their work behind the scene. Thank you, everyone, for joining us um, today for this. Uh, for this event. Uh, I hope you're joining many other events, perhaps today, later this week. Um, and if you want to get in touch with us, uh, our email addresses are on the website of the, of the university. So please do so if you want to hear more. Um, and in the meantime, yeah, let's break the bias. Thank you very much. <laughs>